Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series along with Kirsten Wiley. Today, I am particularly excited to welcome Bill McKibben to Microsoft Research, as I have invited him many times over the years. But there seemed to be um, a feeling, both internal and external, that um, perhaps his themes were not an appropriate conversation for us to have here at Microsoft. Um, <laughs> Because over the years, Bill has written quite directly about the limits of technology, or perhaps more appropriately, has posed questions about how techno technological advances perhaps have created complex and even terrifying problems for our lives, our communities, and our world. Today, Bill is here to discuss his latest look at where we are right now, a world of enormous wealth as a result of dramatic economic growth, yet few of us are better off or happier. We have reached the limits of many things, fossil fuel, water, and other things. And also, we have long surpassed the place where more makes us any happier or healthier. In fact, it turns out it's quite the opposite. In Deep Economy, Bill argues that we need to reimagine our lives in a more local way and to create communities around what he calls the economics of neighborliness. With examples from communities all over the world, Bill explains that not only is this possible, but essential for our survival. Bill McKibben is the author of 10 books and has been awarded the Guggenheim and Lindhurst Fellowships and also the Lannan Prize for nonfiction writing. He is currently a scholar in residence at Middlebury College and is the founder of stepitup07.org, which is working to organize rallies in hundreds of American cities, including ours, on April 14th of this year to demand that Congress enact curbs on carbon emissions to cut global warming pollution by 80% by 2050. Please join me in welcoming Bill McKibben to Microsoft Research. Well, thank you all very much. and It's great fun to be here. It's, in fact, great fun for me to be in this neck of the woods because my grandfather was the mayor of Kirkland uh, back in the day when it was a small shipbuilding town, and he was the only doctor in town. Um, and it's where my father grew up and taking the boat to Seattle to watch the Seattle Rainiers play baseball and, uh, I, you know, so it's a special place for me. It's fun to be here at Microsoft. You will think that because I'm not showing you slides that I'm a kind of low-tech person, but nothing can really be further from the truth. Um, I sort of am experimenting with a technology that I call sort of virtual PowerPoint. And if it works correctly, you'll sort of see pictures in your head as I'm talking um, of <laughs> what I'm working on. I really want to begin by saying thanks to you all for the sets of tools that are uh, letting us this winter organize this thing that I want to talk to you about for a moment, this campaign we're calling stepitup07.org. Uh, I'm going to get to my book in a minute, but this, in an odd way, ties pretty directly into it. Um, I wrote the first book about global warming way back in 1989 uh, when I was 26 or 27. And I've been working on global warming ever since, but becoming sort of desperate about how little we were actually accomplishing and how little was getting done. Um, over the summer, organized a march across the state of Vermont where I live that by its conclusion, after five days of walking, had drawn about 1,000 people, which in Vermont's actually a lot of people. And <laughs> it was more than enough to kind of change the politics in our state around global warming and make all of our federal candidates, even the very conservative Republicans, champions of ambitious and dramatic legislation to do something about it. But the thing that was depressing was to read in the newspaper um, the next day that this thousand people we'd gathered was the largest demonstration that had taken place in this country about climate change, which seemed sort of striking and perhaps explanatory in part of our complete inability to take any action in Washington on this topic for 20 years. And so in January, with no organization and with no money, with me and six brand new Middlebury College graduates, 
uh, we launched a website called stepitup07.org and asked people to please hold rallies on April the 14th to demand large scale to 80% reductions in carbon by 2050. And we said we would you know, try to link all these rallies together eventually uh, um, on the web. We'd sort of have people upload images of them and produce a kind of virtual um, um, nationwide thing. And we did it. You know, we talked about instead doing the kind of traditional thing, which is a march on Washington in this country, a very centralized idea. We didn't have the money or the organizational chops to pull that off. We didn't want the kind of carbon emissions involved in bringing people all across the country to D.C. But more, we sensed that there was a real possibility to do a new kind of political action in this country, a kind of dispersed demonstration that would really make sense because people would be in the places where they could draw attention to why they feared global warming and what they and make that point to their own Congress people in their districts. We had hoped that we might be able to organize about a hundred of these rallies, maybe 150 by the time April rolled around. Um, instead, we sort of tapped into some real desire on the part of people to take action. I haven't checked the website for a couple of hours, but earlier today we were at 989 of these rallies in all 50 states. It's clearly going to be the largest grassroots environmental protest since Earth Day 1970. Um, and, and it's also been very exciting to kind of people in the organi political organizing community to sense that there are new possible models out there now other than the March on Washington or, or the kind of exclusively local action. That we can take an idea, disseminate it via the web, have people do real things in real places, and then link them together again via the web. And hopefully by the end of the day in Washington, we're going to have a big evening program where we'll be bringing these images in from all over the country and showing them to politicians and at the same time webcasting back out the sort of series of speeches and pictures and things back out across the country. God only knows you will have a better idea than I will whether this will actually work or not and whether we'll be able to, you know, make, but, but the, uh, the, the, you know, 21 year olds who are doing all of this tell me that it will and, um, and so I'm happy to, you know, play along. Um, but it's been great fun to watch how this happens. And that, in a minute, is going to connect into the point I want to make that I hope you all will be thinking about, about what the future shape of our economy might begin to look like. Um, there, if there's one powerful, unexamined question, unexamined assumption in our lives, uh, in our culture, in our politics, it's the assumption that more is better. That's been the driving force in uh, pretty much how we make decisions as a society for at least 75 years. We've taken it as the goal of uh, business organizations. We've taken it as our governmental goal. Uh, we measure the GDP, and hence we work on that. And and. Uh, it's become, in fact, unbelievably real to us, more real than real things. I mean, if you think about even the sort of terms that we use to describe the economy, the economy is ailing, the economy has suffered a setback, um, the economy is recovering, um, um, you know, uh, uh, on and on and on. It's very, I mean, we, we have a very tender and affectionate outlook, you know, towards this abstract thing as opposed to paying extremely little attention to the actual, real, physical world, uh, which we take very much for granted and assume that we can do all kinds of things to without any great blowback um, on that end. Those days are coming to an end. Um, with climate change, in particular, we now face a, uh, a challenge larger than human civilization has yet faced. We didn't, we're only slowly understanding the exact scale of that. Now when I wrote this book 
the end of nature back in 1989. I thought we were in trouble, and I thought that global warming was a very strong hypothesis, a hypothesis that science did a good job of proving out within about five or six years. By 1995, there was essentially a solid scientific consensus around the fact that humans were heating the planet and that it was going to be a serious problem. That's a consensus that's deepened and broadened over the years. But in the last two or three years, you all should just know that the very concerned and alarmed scientists who have been working on this for a long time have begun to, in a sense, panic. The news back from the natural world, if you read science or nature every week, is uh, worse and worse and worse. And the basic reason is that we'd underestimated the degree to which the climate system of the Earth was, was finely balanced. So far, humans have increased the temperature of the planet about one degree Fahrenheit. Uh, we would have thought that that would, 20 years ago, that that would be kind of the threshold for feeling the effects of, of global warming and that we were still 20 or 30 years away and maybe another degree or a degree and a half Fahrenheit away from really large-scale changes. But that turned out to be wrong. One of the reasons it turned out to be wrong was that the assumption, and it was a pretty good assumption, I think, at the time, would, what was that positive and negative feedbacks into this system were going to be roughly balanced and that there'd be certain things that would happen you heat up the atmosphere, warm, warm air holds more water vapor than cold. You should get more cloudiness. These clouds would, would deflect some sunlight before it reached the Earth. You'd have a you know, somewhat counterbalancing cooling effect. None of those negative feedback effects have kicked in. The, in fact, the clouds that have formed have been the other kind, the kind that let solar radiation through and trap it from uh, Clouds may even be a positive feedback effect at this point. And a number of really damaging positive feedback effects have turned out to be large and quick. Probably the ones that at the moment are really scaring people the most and sort of give you a sense of the momentum and the kind of out of control momentum of this system have to do with the cryosphere, with the frozen portions of the Earth's surface, all of which are now melting. Some of that melt is pack ice and sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, it's melting with extreme rapidity. We haven't, it's failed to fully reform the last two winters. Um, um, and uh, this is much quicker than we would have thought. Um, the predictions are now that we may see an ice-free summer Arctic uh, as early as 2035 or 2040, which is pretty unbelievable. Um, and of course, it's a feedback effect in itself. You re remove that nice, white, reflective surface. 80% of the sun's rays were hitting that and going back out to space. Blue water absorbs about 80% of that solar input. It amps up the whole process. Even scarier is what happens to the ice over land in Greenland and the West Antarctic. Um, you know, we had assumed that that ice was stable on a kind of century time scale. That is, we could be putting into place the temperature regime that would eventually melt it, but that it would take quite a while. And that was a reasonable bet, too, because, of course, there's a fair amount of inertia in a mile and a half thick sheet of ice. You know, It'd be hard to figure out exactly how you were going to melt it. And the early modeling assumption was you'd get some melt on the top, water would form, it would politely evaporate into the atmosphere, and this would take quite a while. Turns out that's not what's happening. The water is quickly finding, these systems are more fissured and fractured and dynamic than we had assumed. The water is quickly finding ways down to the bottom of these ice sheets where it's serving to grease the skids for their slide into the ocean. That's not good news. There's enough, there's enough sea level rise contained in Greenland alone to put about 25 feet or so of ocean, um, ocean rise, and that would be enough to as Jim Hansen, the NASA climatologist, said not long ago, create a totally different planet, one where vast, you know, where most of our coastal cities would be swamped and where vast swaths of land now hospitable to agriculture or to settlement would no longer exist. Um, it's pretty hard to imagine that kind of world. Um, it's also pretty hard, and Hillar sort of, here I kind of turn back more to the book, it's also pretty hard to imagine stopping short of that picture unless we can very quickly figure out how to get our hands and our heads around 
these sort of questions of, of infinite economic expansion that we're engaged in at the moment. So far, climate change, because it's driven by carbon dioxide, the ubiquitous product of fossil fuel combustion, isn't following the same kind of curves that other sorts of pollution do. As you get richer, some forms of pollution diminish. You get enough money to stick catalytic converters on cars, and hence the air gets cleaner. You know, things like that. Fossil fuel, cheap fossil fuel, is so intimately tied to our economic lives that as the volume of our economy expands, so does the amount of fossil fuel that we burn. And that seems to be consistent. Uh, it's, it's, it's continuing to happen here. Uh, we're lessening the carbon intensity of some of our operations, but not enough to offset the growth in the size of our economies. And it's definitely uh, 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 true in other places, uh, fossil fuel use in, say, China is increasing even faster than GDP at the moment, partly because we're offshoring many of our most energy intensive industries to other parts of the world. The, um, even without global warming, however, it's fairly easy to look at the data and see that the idea that the rest of the world is going to kind of grow into an affluence like ours is pretty hard to pull off. I've spent a lot of time in China and India in the last few years reporting for National Geographic and Harper's and places. And, you know, it's quite amazing to be in vibrant growth economies like that and get some sense of what 10% annual growth feels like and things. In some ways, it's very exciting. Um, if it continues, the Chinese will be as rich as we are by mid-century. If they consume the way that we do, well, forget about it. Um, you know, we have, at the moment, 800 million cars on the planet. If the Chinese alone owned cars at the American rate, they'd add 1.1 billion automobiles to the fleet. If the Chinese diet and the Chinese diet alone was the same as ours, it would consume about two-thirds of the world's grain harvest, just for the Chinese. A world grain harvest that's growing no larger, in fact, has plateaued for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, we need some other idea, because Plan A isn't working all that well. That's the first and sort of most obvious insight of this book. The second, and less obvious, because less sort of it's because it's counterintuitive. That's fairly intuitive. The counterintuitive idea that has begun to emerge from economic research in the last 10 years or so is the answer to the very basic question of at what point does economic growth and increased prosperity cease to provide incremental increases in human satisfaction or happiness? Is all this that we're doing actually producing any increase in human satisfaction. For a long time, economists didn't even bother to take up that question because it seemed soft and ephemeral. Um, how would you measure human happiness and satisfaction? But a few years ago, people began to go to work on it. One of them, a guy named Daniel Kahneman at Princeton, who won the Nobel three or four years ago. And he wrote a book maybe 15 or 12 years ago a book called Hedonics, he worth a few other people, where he began to try to outline what this science might look like. Now, of course, being economists, they, you know, went at it in a particularly un unhappy way. You know, um, the, the early attempts to figure out whether people were good judges of their own satisfaction, because that was the question you needed to answer if you wanted to move beyond the old economic answer, which was, we don't need to know this. Utility is all, you know, utility covers this. We can tell what makes people happy by what they buy. That's as good a proxy as we're ever going to get. If you wanted to move beyond that, you had to know whether or not people were good judges of their own satisfaction. Well, the first set of experiments that these guys did involved having uh, people undergoing colonoscopies rating their pain every 30 seconds or something throughout the procedure, you know, to begin to establish sort of baselines about whether or not people were reliable reporters on their own condition. This kind of research went on, you know, broadened into hundreds of different areas over the next few years. 
And by the time it was done, people became convinced that people actually were pretty good estimators of their own happiness, that people's own estimation correlated with how others saw it. It correlated with certain physical, uh, physiological uh, features on and on and on, which allowed people to go back and look at evidence that people had sort of ignored or paid no attention to for a long time, uh, uh, sort of direct questions about satisfaction. One of the things, one of the interesting pieces of data, and there's not immense amounts, but there's some, one of the interesting pieces of data was a uh, polling set that the National Opinion Research Center had done every year since the end of World War II, asking Americans how happy they were. You could say, I'm very happy, happy, not happy. The number of Americans who say, I'm very happy, peaks in 1956, um, and it goes slowly but fairly steadily downhill since. Not much more than a quarter of Americans will now say they're very happy. That downward curve, of course, is striking because in the same, in the same 50 year period, the curve of our material prosperity has about trebled. If most of the things that we understand intuitively to be true about the economy were in fact true, those two curves would at least move in somewhat the same direction. There'd be some correlation between them. That they instead diverge opens up some interesting place for analysis, some interesting place to think about what's going wrong. And it also introduces just the kind of upsetting possibility that the last 50 years, which is involved in many ways laying waste the earth, may not have actually been all that uh, super and necessary a, a, a time it, if it wasn't yielding anything. To the degree that people can tell what's going on, why it is that people are feeling this way, okay, it seems to have to do, and the evidence is getting more robust all the time, it seems to have to do with a strong sense among Americans that they've lost social connection with other people, a strong sense of a lack of community. If you think about the time frame, it makes sense. Well, what did we do in the 50s? We basically started spending our money to build ever larger houses ever farther out in the suburbs and move into them. And we acquired the first of the sets of screens into which we've spent our time since sort of assiduously peering. Um, that's reduced almost mathematically the possibility of any of us running into each other. Um, um, you know, um, the average American at the turn of the last century, 1900, lived about eight to an acre. That was the average density. Even though we think of it as a kind of rural country, in fact, it was a village and urban country in many ways. Um, the average new housing development in the year 2000 was about two people per acre. So just kind of random Brownian, you know, motion. I mean, you're just going to run into fewer people. And indeed, um, Americans do. We have, on average, about half as many close friends as we did in the 1950s. We're far less likely to eat meals with friends, family, relations, that kind of thing. Um, and I mean, and sometimes this almost goes to the point of farce. You may have seen the story in the New York Times last week about how the new trend in upscale home building in this country, which apparently is well established, is for dual master bedrooms because husbands and wives no longer can sort of abide having to share the room with each other. One pulls too many of the covers off or whatever. Um, um, it turns out that at least past a certain point, and you know, the things that we're losing are more valuable than the things that we're gaining to our sense of well-being and satisfaction. And you can sort of almost do this experiment yourself. If you ask, you know, what would I really rather want? The you know, next generation of flat screen television or a new close friend that I could meet? Well, you know, in a certain sense, there's almost that kind of choice going on in our lives. And we've been schooled to make, at a certain point, bad sets of choices about this. And we've continued to make them. The hopeful part of this book is my sense 
that the answers in certain ways to these two problems, the ecological and this sort of social one, lie in somewhat the same direction, which is in the direction of a shift in trajectory towards more localized economies, where we begin to roll in supply lines a little bit instead of send them ever further out, and hence begin to develop some kind of new um, um, dependence on our neighbors, again, in the process of building those local economies, rebuild some of those uh, 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 relationships. And a good example, one, because you've all have seen them and been to them and things, are, are what actually constitutes the fastest growing part of America's food economy right now, local farmers markets. They're growing 10 or 12 percent a year. They're very good on energy terms. You use a lot less, there's a lot less energy embedded in your food if you're buying, if you're shopping locally. Um, something between about five and 15 times less energy, so call it an order of magnitude less energy because you're not, you know, ordering takeout from 2,000 miles away, which is basically how our industrial food system works at the moment. So there's that benefit, and it really does add up. I mean, there are many parts of this country and this world where 40% of the truck traffic involves shipping food around. The fastest growing parts of the food account of the sort of shipping in the world are shipping, uh, are air shipping fruits and vegetables around the world, which if you stop to think about the energy balances on it, even for a moment, is so insane that you realize it won't last for very long. But that's only half the issue. The other issue is, and I think this will be of particular interest to people thinking about how we, you know, uh, what, how we constitute experience and what, how we network and things. The experience of the farmer's market is largely different than the experience of the supermarket. A pair of sociologists followed people around the two of them a few years ago to find out what the difference was. You all have been to the supermarket. You walk in. Excuse me? Arthur George. You walk in. You visit the uh, you know, same places around the perimeter of the supermarket. You have the interesting paper or plastic conversation on the way out the door. You somehow emerge with the kind of same set of items that you had the week before. That's it. When people went to the farmer's market, they had 10 times as many conversations. I mean, these are social scientists. They're very used to measuring things, you know, 0.18% of a difference, you know, statistically. So 10 times, the order of magnitude, more conversations, an order of magnitude, less energy used. You begin to sense the possibility for shifts that are, you know, large enough to begin to make some difference in the predicaments in which we find ourselves. And you can do many of the same kind of um, analyses for other commodities. You know, energy. We're used to thinking of it after 50 years now in the same kind of centralized model that we think of food. With food, we have Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland, you know, processing most of our calories. With uh, energy, we have a few huge, you know, coal companies and ExxonMobil and a few others. Uh, 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 processing most of our BTUs and electrons for us, and that's where it comes from. But of course, it's possible to imagine, you know, quite different other systems. There was a story in the paper today, uh, in the PI, about uh, a new housing development in Issaquah that's going to be that's going to have net zero energy homes. And the point is that they'll be not off the grid; they'll be grid tied like my house in Vermont. We have solar panels on the roof on a sunny day. We're a utility. We're sending electrons down the line. We're running our neighbor's refrigerator. And when the sun goes in, we suck energy in. Um, it's a distributed energy system that works the way the internet works. You put in, you take out. It's the sort of energy equivalent of a farmer's market. And you know, on and on and on through the list of commodities, many, at least many of the commodities that we care about. Art and entertainment, for instance, in the same way that we think of you know everything coming from centralized uh, you know from Cargill or from Exxon, we think of music as something that comes from Hollywood and Nashville, right? And we consume it. At the turn of the century, in the state of Iowa alone, in 1900, there were 1,300 opera houses 
1,300 live music venues, you know. No one was getting rich in a kind of, you know, Hollywood, Nashville sense. But clearly there were a fair number of people making some part of their living, singing, making music. And there were a lot of people having quite rich, dense experiences of enjoying that together as a community. And in fact, those are the, one of the wonderful things, and here I tread on dangerous ground, one of the wonderful things for me about the kind of file sharing uh, revolution underway is that it's undermining the business model of Hollywood and Nashville. And in fact, the only people, the, the people who are starting to make the most money in the music industry again, are people who are closer to wandering minstrels, you know, the kind of bands that are out touring and making money that way, and often sort of regional um, 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 bands where, the, where it's as much about the experience as it is about the commodity, about the relationship, as it is about the product. Um, all of these possibilities, I think, are enormously interesting um, because they f understand that what we lack is no longer stuff. I mean, in our society, there are a f you know, fairly small number of people for whom lack of stuff is the major problem. I mean, it's a society where storage lockers are one of the fastest growing industries, okay? We have more stuff, literally, than we know what to do with, even though we've built houses that are so enormous that they, you know, serve almost as sort of parodies of homes. Um, and hence, the possibility for cultures that are, or for economies that are much more relational is very possible. And that ha if that's to happen, it almost by definition, partly anyway, needs to be more localized, needs to draw in those supply lines, because in those kind of economies, you have far more interaction with other people. The evolved social animal part of us is far more taken care of. What's particularly good about this moment, however, and is that the biggest problem with that kind of world, the parochialism inherent in smaller, more local communities, is no longer quite the stumbling block that once it was. Because you're able to be, because of the web, in contact, too, with a much wider range of people and to share ideas easily back and forth. And the difference between these sort of, this sort of realm of ideas across the web and, and of commodities and economies is perhaps illustrated just by thinking about, say, how much more sense it makes to share recipes than it does to trade ingredients, you know, f grain or something across thousands of miles. Um, it's far easier and more sensible to do the former than the latter. And for me, and here I will end because I'm, don't, I want to hopefully some dialogue, um, um, for me, this lesson, in a sense, was very much brought home by this Step It Up 07.org thing that we've been doing this year. We were able to have a kind of national idea about what was going, what we wanted to have accomplished, but we were also able to devolve it easily to local groups, all of whom have taken up this challenge and, in fact, have developed rich no local networks uh, you know, around their own action. There's a website for Step It Up Seattle uh, that's organizing six or seven big actions around this part of the world for that day on April 14th. Um, um, the choice is no longer as stark, in a sense, as once it was. And we have more freedom, I think, to move away from models that aren't working so well right now um, and think about some other ones. It's an extremely interesting moment. Because we're being pushed, we're both being pushed by environmental exigency in the direction of change, and I think we're increasingly being pulled, all of the farmer's market, by the desire for some kind of change. And how it all sorts out isn't yet clear, but what is clear is that the kind of work you're doing has some vital role as the, uh, as the intermediary here, as the thing that makes some of this, uh, 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 makes many parts of this, many facets of this possible. Um, 
and how it develops will be extremely interesting to watch. So there I end. Thank you very much. I wonder, I understand, I mean, I don't dispute the point you're making about interpersonal relationships. It agrees with a lot of things I've seen. I wonder if maybe emphasizing that part of it more might actually wag, you know, have the tail wag the dog a bit. Um, I have to admit that while I'm sympathetic to the whole issue of carbon emissions, and I mean, well, I, I'm funny, I'm one of the few nuclear power advocates you know of, because the fact of the matter is nuclear power in the U.S. has released less radiation to the atmosphere than coal plants have. This is one of these funny things that people don't even seem to realize. But um, I wonder, instead of these old, you know, at this point it's an old point, and you have to admit there's an organized opposition, idiots or not, there's an organized opposition. I wonder if maybe trying to appeal to the positive would have an effect. Well, I think that that's quite right, and I think that that's you know, one of the things we're trying to do. Actually, we're trying to sort of work it both ways. Um, we're overcoming on climate the opposition. They're just about beaten. You know, today Al Gore was testifying in Congress, and there was one last beaten down old hack of a Texas congressman, you know, raising the same idiotic set of, you know, graphs and things, the shop-worn stuff that these guys have been passing around uh, for, you know, 15 years. And basically, by the end of the hearing, people were just kind of laughing at him. Even, you know, true amazing progressives like Denny Hastert of Illinois, you know, were saying, look, this is real. We've got to deal with it. Thank you, Mr. Gore, whatever. We're just about there make them richer and less poor. Well, I think that the Mark, way... This is, yeah, this uh, actually, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. This actually leads back to the point you made earlier that we're getting richer and richer and richer, but happiness isn't going up. You know, when I was sitting back here muttering on our... Yes, but where's all the money going? It's very true. There's a kind of short-term and a long-term or a medium-term answer to the dilemma that we're in. And we do have to make the short-term answer to it because, unfortunately, the window on opportunity for doing anything significant about climate change is closing with such rapidity that we got to do some pretty dramatic things pretty fast. Um, the reason that we've taken this kind of 80 percent by 2050 thing as our mantra is not because it's like there's some scientific study that says 82 percent would be too much and 78 too little or whatever. It's because it's a way of saying telling people who are going to be investing lots of capital in over the years that you better take this very front and center in your decision making about what you're building, producing, or whatever. Um, and that's key to get that going quickly. Um, the point of any kind of federal legislation on this will be one way or another, cap and trade, carbon taxes, whatever, to change the relative price signal that fossil fuel sends to the market. Okay? The simplest way to do it would be to have a carbon tax that may be beyond the you know, ability of our political culture to deal with. But some, some way or another, that's the signal that we're going to send. Once that happens, then all the kind of other things I'm talking about will, in fact, become somewhat easier. The forces of economic gravity will begin to assist them rather than hinder them. You know, farmers markets will become that much easier because People who are shipping lettuce 3,000 miles at a crack will begin to have to pay some more of the uh, ridiculous cost of doing that. They'll the the in a sense, because the cost is there, the cost is amortized over the next 500 years. Well, and it's amortized over everybody else. They yeah, don't have well, to. Yeah. It's a large, the point is, it's amortized over a very large pool, and they get their lettuce here. Exactly. Um, and changing some of that economic calculation will help. It's also a cultural shift. And you can see that by seeing how different cultures have made different sets of decisions. The Europeans, 50 years ago, decided to tax energy heavily. Um, there are many results of that that you can see in the physical construction of their landscape and their mass transit system and things. Um, um, one of the most concrete is that Western Europeans 
use half as much energy per capita as Americans. Half's a big number. I mean, it's way bigger than we're going to get from hydrogen or ethanol or nuclear or any of the other things we're talking about. You know, it's a huge number. And one of the really important questions for the next 20 years is whether China and India evolve in a more European, hence somewhat more communal, less hyper-individualistic direction, or in an American direction. The other interesting thing about Europe is that those slides in satisfaction indices haven't occurred there. And if you, you know, look at sort of radical rags like The Economist, um, they, uh, you know, have in the last couple of years done a number of very powerful and interesting attempts to figure out quality of life comparisons among countries. The U.S. does terribly on all of these. We come in at the very bottom of all the developed countries, and we come in behind a lot of developing countries on all kinds of scores of satisfaction, of, you know, uh, life expectancy, of, you know, educational attainment, on and on and on. Our idea that we have figured out the optimal way to run a society is an idea that's not, A, not true, and B, increasingly not shared by the rest of the world. On the, um, well, something um, sort of in that question, there's, there's the issue with the, uh, the sustainable agriculture in particular, that some of the organizations who have, in a sense, the most to lose from this are, are large corporations. Microsoft uh, uh, at least potentially fa faces similar issues with, with open source, which, which has assimilated and diversified in a very different cost structure. How do you see, you know, are there ways to, uh, in the agriculture way, get this to be less threatening to them? Or is it just that, no, you're going to have to outweigh those forces with other things? There's some of both, probably. Um, um, agriculture is a particular example of insane concentration um, that's resulted in the most ruinous kind of both environmental and public policy. Um, um, and it's, of course, self-reinforcing much more than in other sectors because the political power of those players is by now so enormous. And it's aided by their intense geographical concentration. You know, there are basically 35 senators who represent corn, you know. Um, um, that's their job. And it's, it's you know, resulted in the just by many measures, crazy agricultural policy that we have, that's by now yielded a system where there are far more prisoners in America than farmers. Um, you know, where, the, where we've built an agricultural system that absent the inputs of cheap fossil fuel won't work. I mean, it's exquisitely vulnerable to that kind of interruption. I think what we need, uh, say, to use your agricultural example, are ways to start, what's important is trajectory. It's not overnight change, it's backing down from this. Um, and we're not gonna go back to having 50% of Americans on the farm like we did in the 1870s. But we've gone too far in the other direction and public policy can be a big help in, say, beginning to rebuild the agricultural infrastructure, slaughterhouses and canneries and things that are now absent for the most part from our rural landscapes and build the kind of connections with metropolitan landscapes that, and you can see it starting to happen. There are places, and Oregon is one of them, um, where the interest in local food has become so intense that the number, the number of farms in Oregon doubled in the last USDA census period. That's the first time in a long time that the number of farms anywhere in America has begun to go up, and it's happening other places too as a result of this. Uh, I don't think that in the long run, ADM's uh, stock holds up for it. You know, it, in, I mean, that, there's, that there may be a kind of, un, this may not be a squareable circle in this sense. I don't know enough about the uh, world of software to quite understand how that works either. But, the in, but all the interesting juice in the future is in the, I think, in this direction. And one of the reasons is, you know, whatever we do, we're not going to solve the problem, say, of global warming, right? We're, at the moment, in a choice between miserable and catastrophic. Those are the two outcomes that are possible, and we'd have, we have to work very hard to get miserable, you know, as our outcome. There's going to be more of a premium placed on durable, resilient systems, 
communities, whatever, than there has been in the past. Our built economy is geared for total, optimum, perfect conditions. It's not built to withstand and we can even see, I don't know if anybody here has had the chance to be in New Orleans in the year and a half now since Katrina. Well, you'd be unbelievably amazed at what it looks like. Because what it looks like is much large swaths of it look like the toughest parts of the developing world. I mean, it's not coming back. It was dealt a blow for which the system was not able to, you know, engineer its recovery. And we're beginning to see, you know, a lot of economic parts of that come into play already. Uh, you know, people have stopped writing insurance for big parts of this country, and they're gonna, it's going to get harder and harder to get in big parts. It was Swiss Re and the Harvard, um, and Harvard issued a study last year talking about how with a few more storms we'll reach a point where essentially economic activity will become extremely difficult to get going again in the southeast because the insurance that you know underwrites that lubricates every economic transaction every new business everything in our country will become increasingly impossible to get that's one of the traps that large parts of the developing world are in you know and uh, so resilience and durability may become more important than some of the other virtues we've tried to build into our economy, extreme, uh, you know, sort of hyper efficiency and and th and and cheapness, um, things may shift a little. So um, my, my question is about uh, nuclear power and kind of your mm. prediction about that. And um, I'm you know, somewhat familiar with the arguments that oh, it's way too risky. You know, the the radioactive material will last for ha half a million years and all that. I'd like, as an engineer, I'd like to think that a lot of these risks can be engineered away. But, but give, taking it as a given that the risk can't be engineered away completely, given a choice mm. between the future of the path we're going down now, burning up all the fossil mm. fuels and you know the sea level rising 25 feet and all that, and either engineering away to, to, the, to the best extent we can and, and then simply living with a certain mm -hmm. level of risk implied by nuclear power, it seems to me sort of intuitively obvious that we're going to go the path of nuclear power, right? And what, what do you think about that? Here's my guess. The first thing to be said is you're absolutely right. The best thing about just sort of bringing up even up the question of nuclear power is it allows you to understand how dangerous a coal-fired power plant is, okay? A nuclear power plant carries risk. Any new coal-fired power plant carries the absolute certainty of destruction, you know, going on. Okay, so that's a very good thing to... And it's a very good way to allow people to understand why we should be endlessly scared of coal and why there should be a moratorium on the construction of new coal-fired power plants in this country instead of there being 150 big ones on the books in some stage or another at the moment. That said, my guess is that nuclear power is going to be a minor player in the solution to this problem. And the reason is just economics. Um, it's an expensive way to generate power. If you give me the billion or two that it costs to build a new nuclear power plant today, I can give you six or seven things to do with that that'll get you three, four, five times the carbon bang for the buck. Um, most of them involving conservation. That's where the low-hanging fruit is. We tend to think kind of backwards, I think, about energy often. And the first question is always going to be, how do we generate it? The better question at the moment is, how do we keep from having to generate so much? And those answers are I mean, one of the advantages of being the most energy-wasting society that there's ever been on Earth is the unbelievable amount of low-hanging fruit that there is to pick, right? So give me the money that you're going to use for your ambitious nuclear power program and instead use it to retool Detroit to produce cars with 30% better gasoline mileage, to, um, you know, install the uh, highest... Uh, highest efficiency motors and pumping systems in every industrial plant in this country to re-insulate and rewire homes across the country for high. And the carbon payoff is way bigger. Once we get there, once we reduce energy demand conspicuously, and remember, as I said, the Europeans use half as much energy as we do, and ironically, they're a lot further along figuring out how they're going to cut 
that half by another 80% than we are to getting anywhere. Once you do that, then other sources of power that are less politically problematic begin to become easier to imagine. And the kind of, I, I think the one real conceptual downside with nuclear power is that it continues to enmesh us in this model of very centralized power production that flows one way out. And I'm, I think in the long run, I, this is just a guess, but I think it's more interesting to imagine this distributed energy paradigm um, that's a lot more resilient than that in the long run. I, I could be wrong, and nuclear power doesn't scare me. It scares me mostly as a distraction and a diversion of resources at the moment, more than a you know incredible threat to, I mean, look, um, there's an unbelievable number of things that in the best of all possible worlds we wouldn't be doing building nuclear power plants, putting windmills on top of ridges, you know, on and on and on. We don't live in the best of all possible worlds. We don't even live anywhere close to the best of all possible worlds. The choices we have are, you know, going to be tough in a lot of ways. Um, and we need to make them very logically um, without uh, 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 and, and avoid sort of ideology and avoid the other problem with nuclear power is the government subsidy that we've given it for so long has given it an kind of outsized political power. Yeah. Um, it has more political influence than it deserves, and it's possible that it, that's been used to tilt the balance at the moment. But those are just a few ideas, re-nuclear power. It's actually the first time you ever seen here that doesn't have that Enjoy the last thing. Um, but actually, the, the message seems to be mixed. So, I mean, um, um, the farmers' market have been there like the very much, and, and the two points you made is that one, um, we talk to people more, so we'll have a <coughs> community feeling is a localization. And then it's also more energy efficient. Okay. Um, so both are good. And then coming to that gentleman's question that I have in mind too, that in software design, um, maybe a few pro very good programmers here at Redmond or in Red Hat writing software that everybody uses would be more efficient than having a lot of people writing a lot of software and, and, and not compatible with each other. Um, so in this case, we have uh, sort of more centralization means higher efficiency. So that's sort of a, um, no longer have the nice alignment as farmer's market where more localization means higher efficiency. So it, in this case, um, do we have to choose one? Probably not. I mean, efficiency is one of the most interesting concepts that we have, OK? And we often, we got to be clear what we mean when we start talking about it, because often we mean different things. I mean, for instance, our food system at the moment, our industrial food system is highly efficient in that it delivers lots of calories for low price. It does that by externalizing all the costs uh, uh, onto the future, onto the environment, onto whatever else. I mean, software is a very strange commodity, you know, in that the material inputs into its construction are remarkably low, right? And so the questions become more, I think, become just more interesting about, and I, and I have no idea what the answers to them are, about what, kind, you know, what creates resilient and strong systems, and whether it's you know, uh, uh, great design by a few incredibly talented people, as you understand it, or whether it's design by enormous numbers of people cross-checking each other's work you know, in the sort of wiki, uh, open source sort of idea or, or how it is. I, I have no idea about that. Um, a, um, and sort of time will tell which of those is the, the model that, that really works. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, in software, I don't know what, where the, how the, this will work out. Um, um, if I were going to guess, if I were going to guess, I'd say we may reach a point 
where there are going to be lots and lots of interesting different design possibilities bubbling up from lots and lots of different places and that they'll be sort of field tested by a large by the sort of large community but there may be things since I don't write software there may be things inherent in its design that make that difficult and that will mean that the kind of open source approach is impossible or impractical in the long run I, I don't know enough to know You're, that one I'll solve food and energy for you, and you can solve <laughs> software for me. Uh, I'm not going to debate the nuclear energy thing, um, although I think there's an argument to be made for it as well. But I wonder what you have to say about all of the regulatory encroachments that pretty much make it impossible right now to have things like a distributed energy supply. I mean, I was looking at this myself because uh, I don't know why I live in North Redmond, where we have at least one week long power failure every year. And um, I was looking, I mean, you'd think we were, wouldn't, but we do. Uh, and I was looking at, say, the idea of getting a uh, one kilowatt or two kilowatt natural gas fuel cell, which has 50% mm. waste heat, uh, which, I, which actually isn't a problem because I can stick that right into my water heater. Right. You know, the thing that occurs to me is when you have on-site generation, you can always do cogeneration. So you can yep. effectively have 95% efficiency, yep. even if part of it's heat. But the problem with that is, is if I have excess, I get to sell it back to the utility for literally one twelfth of yeah. what I have to pay them for the same amount of energy. Right. And this is one of these things. We have a problem. I see it partly. Part of the problem we have with centralization right now is the regulations are skewed in their direction. Well, and this is a result of political power exactly. that goes with money. Oh yeah. And it may be, you know, and some of the same things may happen even in the software industry, for all I know. Oh, yeah. But the, um, the, um, <laughs> the. Uh, the software energy, they hate the big guys, but that's a, that's a different story. The, um, or it might be the same story. I don't know. But the, uh, the, uh, those are precisely the kind of hurdles that we need to overcome, and they're overcomable. There are states that are now beginning to work hard, you know, to sort of rewrite the net metering laws. To, to Governor Montana. Yeah. The, Just wonder. Yeah, yeah. I've heard you talk. Yeah. I could, I, I could almost swap your two places. That's not criticism, but I could almost swap your places. Look. Political ground on some of this stuff is changing fast. The world from six weeks ago or six months ago is very different than it is now. Partly that's because the period from 2000 to 2006 was one of the weirdest, most locked in place, unchanging political environments that this country's ever experienced. Certainly in the kind of fast paced technological change world we think we live in, nothing happened for six years. And <laughs> Things are suddenly breaking very fast. When we started this, say, this step it up thing, right? People were saying 80% by 2050, that's so radical. You shouldn't talk about that. It's unrealistic. Pick some goal. You can achieve whatever. So, well, this is like the minimum that's scientifically necessary. So that's Friday, uh, John Edwards, running for president, announced his new energy plan. 80% by 2050 was the headline. Today, Al Gore said we need 90% by 2050. And Congress, you know. Um, in the foot. Mm, maybe. You I don't think me. so. I, I understand the goal, but, you know. I think we're, I think that. We live in a country where science education has been shot in the foot and people don't get it. No, this is actually, this is the good news. The polling data is pretty clear now. 70% of Americans or more think that global warming is a serious problem that needs addressing. Now, whether that means they're willing to pay more taxes or not is not yet clear. And that's where the leadership is going to have to come in. You know, I think it's going to be a central issue of the next campaign. And then I think after that, some of these other issues are creeping up r real fast. The, the, yeah, we have some other questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you'd started by talking about our quest for increased GDP. I'm having trouble imagining what America would be like with constant GDP. I mean, there'd be no investment, there'd be no willing wish to save. I'm trying to think of other societies which didn't increase GDP, and middle-aged Europe comes to mind with extreme social ossification and lack of uh, opportunity and mobility, and a lot of injustice. Is there a solution to that? I think so. I mean, of course, one of the things to bear in mind is that even increased GDP hasn't prevented extreme social ossification in our society. 
levels of inequality in the last 20 years in this society have increased more. I mean, we're at a stage we haven't seen since the Gilded Age, uh, you know, in this country in terms of uh, uh, inequalities of income and that kind of thing. Um, in fact, I think that if we move toward these more localized and regionalized economies, that may in fact turn out to be sort of one of the long-term benefits. But you're right that it would be extremely different and it is hard to imagine. In fact, there's no real way to imagine it until we start sort of playing it out piece by piece. And as I say, it's a trajectory problem, not a you know, light switch problem. Um, we don't do it overnight. But one way to think about it, or sort of imagine that transition, is to think a little bit about, say, European economies, okay, which are, have had less GDP growth than we have had and have had a number of other, you know, results as, as, as part of that. You know, the average European has between half and two-thirds the disposable income that Americans do because they're taking their productivity, which is as high as ours, A, in the terms of public goods, and B, in terms of time, right? We work many fewer hours. Um, and the results are all, you, you know, you can see that they do not equal the dark ages. It doesn't mean there aren't stresses, and there are going to be more stress. I mean, the more globalized the economy becomes, the harder that position, in a sense, is to maintain. And it's one of the reasons that, the, uh, that a move in this direction is going to require significant restrictions on what markets can and can't do. You know, it will require all kinds of interventions to make sure that things stay at a certain scale and to punish them for growing beyond a certain scale eventually, to put real, say, uh, uh, real advantages into the local and regional production of food as opposed to the uh, importation of it from thousands of miles away. We can accomplish a lot of that by changing the price structure of energy, which is the fundamental force in our economy still. But we're also going to have to do it legislatively, and we don't know what it's going to look like, and it's going to be a process, not a overnight transition. But I, I wouldn't think, I think dark ages is not the first sort of thought I'd have. One of the things to bear in mind, of course, is though we're having our stresses at the moment, we come at this from a position of relative strength, right? We're ungodly rich in any kind of historical or world terms now. Deployed creatively, we have some margin to work with, um, you know. Um, one of the most important parts of this process is going to be, and it's beginning to happen, the engagement of economists in thinking about the tools that we need to make this happen. Economists have been content to be priests of the cult of economic growth for 50 years. That's pretty much all they've worried about. But they have a whole toolkit full of things that can allow us to, to ease this transition into a world, a steady state world which we're going to need because, as I say, I mean, I think it's in ecological terms, if nothing else, pretty clear that plan A is pretty damn hard to pull off for very much longer. Oh, I'm sorry, let me ask someone who hasn't asked a question. Um, every study I've seen of the economy going in the next 50 years shows continued growth. Global warming causes economic growth by the destruction of properties and relocation of people. Well, this, this actually makes one of the interesting points, of course, about economic growth that we don't think of often enough, which is how badly we've done, you know, how silly it's been to aggregate all economic activity under the category of growth, you know. I mean, in our society at the moment, the most productive human being is the person, you know, leaving their chemotherapy appointment to drive to their divorce lawyer who has an expensive automobile accident along the way. You know, <laughs> think of the amount of economic growth that they've engendered in the course of the day. Um, and, and, but n very little of that is activity that you know, amounts to anything other than that kind of churn. Uh, you know? um, and you're very right. I mean, if, if, <laughs> if we have to keep rebuilding New Orleans year after year after year, at least for a while, it's going to produce a lot of economic activity. At a certain point, it's going to break the system, too. 
And I think that's what most of the modeling, I mean, that's what, if you read this Stern report, this fellow Nicholas Stern, the British economist that the British government hired to, to do the biggest study we yet have on costs of global warming, which came out in October, it was pretty stark in its depiction of what those costs would be over the long run. The uh, scale he was using was economic damage larger than the Depression and the two world wars combined without the offsetting you know, economic advantages that those produced along the way. Understood. The other half is that money is a unitless currency. It's a relationship of things. If you run less oil in the world, the price goes up. Understood. If you look at it as in terms of inflation, every raw commodity in this world will get more expensive. Paradoxically, you will have a bigger economy in unitary terms. One of the things to think about economically, I think, is that fossil fuel may not fit our models as well as everything else does, our sort of standard economic models, right? Um, it seems increasingly likely that fossil fuel was the, is the exception to most of our economic rules um, in that the substitut substitutability proposition that works for so many other things doesn't work so well for it for the kind of reasons we've been describing. Fossil fuel was magic. That's what underwrote our economic expansion. Suddenly you had this thing, easy to get at, incredibly compact, easily transportable, filled with BTUs, you know, you just light a match to it and it burns, you know, it couldn't be easier. And that's, that's what has made all of this at some level possible. And it's going to be wrenching, I think, to do without it. Our attempt, the first attempt to do without it is going to be, as oil begins to become more and more problematic, um, to dwindle, is going to be to try to substitute coal for everything that we're doing at the moment. But the mathematics of global warming make that insanely dangerous thing to do. The two of those converging things, I think, are going to explode a lot of the paradigm we're working with at the moment. We shall see. I just wanted to give a couple references. Um, for the point you brought up, I think there's a good argument that risk isn't fully factored into our economic models. Lorette Beck's book from the uh, late 80s, The Risk Society, I think makes a really persuasive argument that allocation of risk is going to be the uh, 21st century with allocation of capital was in the 20th century. In terms of your point about the uh, software engineering, I think the agile movement, really the whole mashup culture on the web, even if you look at some of the I things IBM is doing with massively collaborative, very geographic distributed, I think it's it's pretty clear that there are some very scalable distributed cost structures that result in high quality software. I'd say Linux is another example. Benkler's um, Wealth of Networks, while it's a, while it's a somewhat problematic book, I think has some really interesting things to say there. But the decentralization software and decentralized uh, into a few developers. Is no, no, I, I, think, I, think, I think this is few developers in the source movement too that could be distributed. Geographically distributed. There's two, there's two voices over here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I want to uh, uh, hear your, more of your thoughts about how to reverse that dissatisfaction or satisfaction going down in America and how to stop that from going down in the developing world. Mm. Because we can't all be fed by farmer's markets. The food production has plateaued because we need to use fossil fuel uh, based fertilizers to supplement the, the, the topsoil that we've depleted. And we can't just you know, use green materials for building. We have to build smaller houses, which Absolutely means we right. have to like our neighbors more. <laughs> so how do you, you know, a lot of people the, eat because they're unhappy. They buy because they're unhappy. So I think that's key. This is right. And you've reached one of, the, I mean, one, of the, one of the important parts of what I'm saying is that at least in this culture, we've got to figure out how we begin to consume more of the, I mean, at the moment, we're trying to meet non-material needs through material possessions, OK? And it's, that's what's not working. And we've got to figure out how to back away from that. 
Now, in the developing world, that's much tougher because you're still at the point. I mean, I've spent a lot of time, as I say, in the last few years out in rural China. I mean, if you're living in a small hut with eight other people, you've got community to spare, you know? There's way more, and you're not worried about, like, building dual master bedrooms. There's four people in the bed, you know? And, and so you're still at the point on this scale where some more stuff actually yield. And, and the, the cutoff point, actually, at which the economic scatter effect of this seems to shift is about $10,000 per capita income. After that, there's the correlation between increased income and happiness evaporates. Okay? Um, it's very difficult to, to sort of, and the last part of the book is devoted to the question of trying to figure out how responsibly to talk to the developing world about these questions. It's maybe the biggest conundrum that we have. I think that the hope is, if there is any hope, is that the same kind of technological leapfrogging that has to go on in the developing world, you know, the same way that we've gone from no communication to cell phones and skipped landlines, which obviously is, you know, what we should have been doing for the last six years is doing everything we can to pay China and India to skip over the centralized power station thing and go to village-based renewable energy and stuff like that as a technology. Um, um, that that same kind of thing, we have to figure out how to do that leapfrogging a little culturally, too. Um, extremely difficult. It's possible that everybody has to pass through our experience before they can begin to realize its limitations. If that, well, that's the, that's the hopeful case. Um, and that's why I said there was such a key question is whether we can sort of point in that slightly. At heart, the mistake that America made, I think, was to allow ourselves to become this hyper-individualistic culture. Individualism is part of our thing, and it's part of what made America what it is. But it got way out of control, I think, in this society. And we're paying heavy prices for that. And it would be a great gift to China and India to kind of figure out a way to communicate that and encourage them not to go quite down that exact road. It's a question and a, a comment and a question. Mm. So if you look at the reality on the ground in places like India and China, their aspirational models are actually coming from the United States. And that, 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 to some extent, it's So that's sort of uh, an issue, right? So the question is, how do you, and I, I disagree with the proposition that the United States would be the one reaching out to sort of teach them. I, I think the imperative in those cultures is actually stronger because the environmental destruction is far more severe. So my guess is that they'll be teaching happening in the other direction. I agree. They, it's, for them, it's a matter of survival. For us, it's a matter of choice. You know, for the next 20, 30 years, most people can Might be able to be wasting for. away the energies and resources, but those people have an issue of survival. So breakthroughs will probably come out of there. Yeah, I think fresh right. thinking will come out of there and not from here. I tend to think you're right, but I do think especially in these energy questions, unless the United States can begin to get its own house in order, we can't be even a credible participant in the international dialogue about this. And we've got to be, because our role in helping set the price of energy by, by default at the moment is so powerful that it overwhelms most good efforts along this way. The problem is even today, most of the conversation has been presented, the debate has been presented in economic terms. Mm. It's not just an economic issue. I think going back to the, the issue you raised, what do people aspire to? You know, if I'm aspiring to big houses, then, you know, just being efficient about putting energy saving devices is not it. I mean, you know, Absolutely. living in a 1,500 square foot house is going to give you more savings than living Absolutely. in 3,500 square foot house. If I'm having to commute 10 miles a day to, you know, to go eat a burger, that's uh, energy wasting device. So it's what people aspire to. How do you, that change is very difficult to do in a generation or two. It's extremely difficult. And that's why I think local economies are so interesting. I think really the only hope of it happening is to intensify and rapidly intensify. I mean, you can preach about community all you want, right? And it gets you basically nowhere. I mean, it's become an almost sort of buzzword. The only way to build it 
is to build the sort of sets of daily interactions that actually constitute a working community. And, and I don't know, I mean, look, I'm no enormous optimist. I wrote a book called The End of Nature, okay? Um, um, I don't have any great faith that we're actually going to pull all this off. But I do think that there's a kind of window open where we might, and I think we have enough good examples now of what's possible that we can think along these lines. And I do think that the one, you know, one of the interesting things that you all know better than almost anyone is that we live at a time of dis discontinuous change, that technologies work in very odd ways. Um, and that one of the hopeful things is that this, you know, the existence of this world-changing technology, which turned out not to be the computer and its processing power, it turned out to be the web and its linking power. That turned out to be the interesting technology. The other was just, you know, paper and pencil on steroids, but this was something new and, and potentially different. That that kind of discontinuity, um, um, you know, is a hopeful sign that there may be change accelerants out there that we're only beginning to understand. And uh, we shall see. But, you know, the other thing about local economies, just to repeat myself, is if things are going wrong, that's where you really want to live, <laughs> you know. Uh, if things are beginning to come a little unglued and we're not taking care of the problem, then the premium on having neighbors that you can depend on and supply lines that make sense and things is ten times what it is in a kind of theoretical sense. Maybe one more question. One more. I think there's one back there. So then, and as an extension of that, what's the role of cities then in the future, especially high-density cities where you somewhat have extremely missing links to a local economy, like you have no agriculture well, that's within a reasonable distance of transportation. That's what's so interesting, because of course you could, without much trouble. Um, you know, 50% of America's agriculture takes place in metropolitan counties or counties immediately adjacent to metropolitan area, metropolitan counties. At the moment, all... I don't have the... But it's the county, either the county that the city is in or the next county out, okay? Um, and in calorie or in, in revenue? Fifty percent of, I think, of caloric production, okay? And what's cool about that, I mean, at the moment, it doesn't make any difference because it all just gets sucked up into a commodity food stream and disappears. But it allows, I mean, think about New York. I mean, one way to approach this problem is to remember that virtually every city on Earth, everybody ate locally until 75 years ago, okay? I mean, New Jersey was called the Garden State for a reason. Um, um, and most of that soil is still there. In fact, you know, upstate New York is filled with abandoned farms that are now actually beginning to spring back to life as the demand for local food starts to really flourish. And it wouldn't, it's not at all improbable to imagine local food systems in, say, the Seattle area. Or, I mean, Portland, it's now happening. The number of farms has doubled in Portland. Uh, in, in the metro area. Uh, you know, Madison, Wisconsin, 20,000 people every Saturday at the farmer's market around the state capitol. Those cities are incredibly important part of this. I mean, because they're the most efficient. I mean, New York is the greenest place in America in a lot of ways. Its energy intensity is extremely low, right? And not only its energy intensity, I mean, it's, it, it sort of has, it sort of demonstrates the point about consumption and relationships and things. One of the reasons that people use less energy is because they live in like small apartments because they're everybody's crowded together, right? Um, but one of the reasons that people are willing to live in small apartments as they are across Europe is because the city itself works. It functions as a home entertainment center, you know? <laughs> Hence you have less need for the, you know, 79 inch thing on the wall, you know, or the huge home theater or whatever, you're out in this place. That richness of experience and density of relationship makes cities very powerful players, I think. The toughest landscapes for this change to happen in are suburbs, just because their physical construction is so dispersed and spread out. And unfortunately, 50, depending how you measure it, 50 or 60% of Americans live in them now. 
That's going to be the most interesting challenge, is figuring out how to kind of knit those together. There are some advantages. There's a lot of open space that's now growing you know, heavily fertilized and pesticided grass that might be put to other more interesting uses and <laughs> so on and so forth. But that's going to be the really, I think, the most interesting challenge. Uh, cities, are, I think, are going to be relatively OK with all of this going forward. You could also triple the density of suburbs rather easily. <laughs> that would be good, too. Thank you all. Mm.